Now, let me turn to Dr. Lori to start the first presentation. Dr. Lori. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to discuss with you today new advances in the diagnosis and treatment of colorectal cancer. I'm John Lori. So we're going to be reviewing a number of objectives. The first is to look at how oncology is changing from a, a one-size-fits-all approach to trying to personalize therapies. And this is really going to be highlighted by exploring a number of novel treatments that take into account mutations or changes in certain genes or different abnormalities that we can try and target. And then we're going to be discussing new approaches to trying to identify these targets so that way we can treat better and better select uh, the right treatment for the right patient. And this is going to be looking at a new technology called circulating tumor DNA, as well as some RNA-based classifier. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that is later. So oncology has really changed dramatically since the first descriptions of it. So the first descriptions are dating back to ancient Egypt and there's papyrus scrolls talking about tumors being in parts of the body and being removed or burned and that being a way of treating them. And really there it was this idea of kind of what, what the clinician saw in front of them. Well, that moved into an era that was defined by pathology and so a biopsy would be performed. We find out where the cancer actually started. So if it started in the lung or in the colon, we treat cancers based on where they started and what we know they're sensitive to. And we've moved now into an era of molecular oncology. And what that is, is we're not just looking at did a cancer come from the colon or did it come from the lung, but what are the particular abnormalities that drive that cancer? What makes it not normal anymore and makes it basically a set of cells that aren't following the rules that they're supposed to follow anymore? And so our goal is really to take patients with particular abnormalities and treat them specific to those abnormalities that are in their cancers. That way it's a more precise treatment. This has really been fostered by the drop in sequencing costs. So since the first human genome was, was sequenced in the early 2000s, we've seen a dramatic fall in the cost of sequencing. And you can see really after about 2014, 2015, the, the prices come down um, to a level that's allowed us to implement in the clinic sequencing so that way we can we can take not just from a research perspective, but from a standard care perspective, this information and use it to help make decisions. And when we look back just to 2014, what you see is that the decision tree for an oncologist and a patient together is quite linear. We try one treatment, when that doesn't work, we switch to another. And we had really one kind of side branch that was using what we call a biomarker uh, which is something that helps us select the right treatment for the right patient. That was called RAS, and otherwise it was this linear tree. Now fast forward to now, in 2021, and what we see is that there's a lot more arrows, it looks a lot more confusing, and you see a lot more different uh, gene names on there. And so we take into account all of this information when trying to select the right treatment for the right patient. And so we've had, you know, in a period of seven years, this dramatic change in the field where we not only have new therapies, but the, the whole idea of how we treat cancer is different. And so a lot of this is driven by these biomarkers. And so this is basically uncovering what is going wrong in the cancer. You can think of a cancer's genome basically is a recipe book of all the things that cell is ever going to have to do. And at times there can be recipes that are spelt wrong and each of these are individual recipes of what's, what's wrong in that cancer cell and we've figured out how to try and treat those issues. Now I think of these biomarkers coming in two flavors. The first set are on the left there and what you see is these particular abnormalities and their prevalence which is the shaded blue part around the ring. Some of them are very common, such as KRAS and NRAS mutations. Those occur in more than half of patients. And others are quite rare, so things like an NTREC fusion, which we're going to talk about, but that occurs in less than 1% of patients. And trying to identify these things is really important to pick that right treatment. On the right-hand side of the slide, you also see a different kind of biomarker. And so we use the patient's per where the tumor actually started in the body as a way to try and pick the, the right therapy. So patients that are on the left side of the body and that's from the splenic flexor to the rectum, so in the top right corner down to the rectum, that's the, where the stool comes out. Those tumors actually behave a little bit better. They're, they have a better prognosis, we say, so patients will live longer with that type of cancer. Um, but they also respond differently to certain targeted drugs. And so those on the left, we feel really high tech when we're talking in the clinic about them. And on the right, we feel a little silly that we don't quite understand what makes the left side different from the right um, yet, but um, we're still learning about that. One of the most important pathways for colon cancer is the MAP kinase pathway. 
And so what this is, is the blue circle that you see there is the cell. And the cell basically has these receptors on the surface. Those receptors are things that sense the surroundings around them and, and learn from the body when they're supposed to grow. And that's normal. Normally our cells are supposed to respond to stimuli and grow. And what happens is there's kind of a, a relay race where the signal is passed throughout the cell down through different genes. So those genes make proteins and the proteins use that make the signal. So we have RAS, BRAF, MEC, ERK. These are just parts of that relay race, basically telling the cell what to do until it finally actually causes its effect. Well, we have drugs that can target the very top part, that receptor. And if you have a problem anywhere in the pathway below, those drugs don't work because they're acting above where the problem is. And, and the cell is kind of uh, keeps going despite having that, that uh, treatment there. So I'm going to show you about those. The first one is KRAS or NRAS mutations. On the left, those are survival curves. And what those are looking at is how long does a treatment work on patients that are receiving it? On the x-axis, you're seeing a length in time in months. And on the y-axis, you're seeing uh, the proportion of patients that are alive at a certain time. And what you see is that in the bottom left of the slide, you see in patients who have the mutation, the drugs don't work. If you receive no treatment, which is the dotted line, you had you live just as long with your cancer as if you received the drug. However, on that top, top left curve, what you see is that there's a nice split suggesting the treatment works. What's interesting is when you layer this information with the location of the tumor, what we've learned is that if you have a left-sided tumor, it's better to start with this targeted drug plus chemotherapy that targets anti-EGFR, so that receptor. But if it's on the right side, that's actually a bad idea. And it's better to use a drug that targets something called bevacizumab. And so it's not just that we have the sequencing information, but it's layered on with the information about the clinical situation that's helpful to make decisions. The next gene in that pathway was BRAF, and these mutations are, are somewhere between 5 and 10% of patients, depending on if it's in the early stage or metastatic setting. And in the top right curve, what you see is the patients who have the mutation, that's the blue line, they have a much worse survival, so they don't live as long. So the average life expectancy is 11 months compared to 60 months in this study, um, or 43 months for patients who don't have that mutation. Now, there's something that's come out in the past two years is we have drugs that can target this BRAF mutation. So they actually, they target both the receptor on that surface, the EGFR, and they also block the damaged protein, that BRAF uh, mutation. And what you can see on the right is the survival curve from this study. And again, you see that there's the black line, patients who didn't receive that treatment, and the red and blue line, patients who did receive treatment that targets BRAF. And so now we've got a treatment that works. And what's really exciting is it not only works, but it works and patients feel good while they're receiving it. So the side effects are very manageable and patient quality of life is improved when they're receiving it. So this is a really important step forward. And it's now being assessed to see whether we can use it earlier in treatment. So if we find the BRAF mutation, should we use this drug the first moment that we know about it or should we save it for later? Because that's where this first study, the Beacon study was done. It was once patients had progressed on other therapies, but maybe we should use it earlier. The next abnormality is something called MSI, or deficient mismatch repair. What this is, is on the left, you're looking at a strand of DNA where there's different letters, and that's basically how the recipe is spelt. And the C there in red is the misspelled character. And the purple thing that's above it is a protein that's supposed to sense the damage and fix the C that's not supposed to be a C. Well, this is kind of like spell check on the computer. And you know that spell check, it works, it works good sometimes, but it does make mistakes, and that's how our normal bodies are. Well, in some versions of spell check, it can be even worse. And that's what happens in when there's deficient mismatch repair. We get more mutations, and it makes it easier for the immune system to recognize a cancer as abnormal and attack. And so what we've learned is that immunotherapy works very well if patients have this abnormality. Again, it's a small population. It's only about 5% of patients that have this abnormality in the metastatic setting. But you can see on the top right curve, that's when we look at the very first treatment patients receive and compare chemo to immunotherapy. And you see a nice split where the teal curve is, you know, patients don't, uh, after kind of the halfway point, very few patients progress. And on the bottom curve there on the right, you're looking at patients who they've had many different treatments before and they receive immunotherapy. And the really exciting part about immunotherapy is what you see at the end, how things are kind of flat, the curve stops going down. So there's some patients who have these really tremendous deep responses where the cancer basically 
doesn't cause problems for a long time, and there's even thoughts that some patients might be cured. Now, we get nervous saying that because we're a bit superstitious, um, and we don't want to jinx things, but there are these patients who are able to stay off therapy for a really long period of time. And again, these are quite well-tolerated treatments for many patients. So again, trying to, to give the right treatment to the right patient. Fusions represent another really exciting new area. And what a fusion is, is basically taking two genes that are separate genes and something happens. So the teal and the purple there are the, the two different spots on the, on the DNA strand. Those are chromosomes on the left. And you've put them together in, in a wrong, wrong way. And so they're fused together and you get this protein that's got the blue and the purple together that's not normally supposed to have the blue and the purple together. Those are parts from different genes. And you could kind of think of it like you've got a minivan or a moving van and you've got a jet and you take the back end of the jet and you put it on the front of the van. And so now you've got this hybrid vehicle that's doing something, you know, it's moving really fast and it's trying to deliver things somewhere. And it's kind of the same way where now you've got this protein that does something it really shouldn't do. So fusions, the first one we've really seen activity for GI cancers is something called NTRK. So N-T-R-K. Um, are the letters that spell the, fu the fusion um, gene, and it can be fused with a number of different genes as partners. And what's interesting is this is something that causes signaling in the cell, and when the fusion happens, the signaling goes awry. It's a quite uncommon thing to have happen in colon cancer, but it's very common in a number of rare cancers. And so this is something where we've learned that it doesn't matter where the cancer starts as much, it matters more that there's this particular abnormality that we found that's causing the problem. These are waterfall plots, and what that means is it's looking at what's the deepest response. How much does the cancer shrink? So on the y-axis, what you're looking at is there's percentages there, and when it goes down to minus 100, that means all of the spots disappear. And there's a line there that goes across that shows minus 30%. So that's what we consider a response, shrinking by at least a third, really. And what you can see is that most patients have their, their tumors shrink quite a bit while they're receiving this drug. And again, very well tolerated. It's a targeted therapy. And so this is really exciting and one of those novel classes. Another novel class is what we call an antibody drug conjugate. So the body has antibodies that target bacteria and different things that it aren't supposed to be there. These antibodies are kind of like heat-seeking missiles. They, they go and they grab onto what's not supposed to be there. Well, scientists have learned how to add a medication that's attached to it, a really high dose of chemotherapy that can basically be dropped off at where the tumor is because we've made these antibodies that are specific to abnormalities on the tumor. So HER2 is a particular gene that there can be too many copies of, too much of it on the outside of the cancer cell, and that causes the cell to grow. Well, in, in colon cancer, it's not as common as in breast cancer. In breast cancer, we see that a large number of patients will have this abnormality. In colon cancer, it's only around 2 to 3%. But we've learned that this, this treatment actually works quite well. And so this was a study that came out, that was presented uh, at uh, a big meeting last year. And just last week, the final study came out. And what we see is that almost half of patients have their tumors have a response and shrink by using this treatment. And again, you know, there are some side effects, but because it's really a targeted treatment, there's less side effects. And we're hopefully giving a, an effective therapy to patients who have just that abnormality. And we're not using a, a therapy that's not going to work for patients who don't have this abnormality. So really trying to be precise about what we're doing. Now, a lot of this is informed by biopsies where we take a, a sample from the tumor in the body with a needle um, or forceps that basically grab a chunk of the tissue. But we have a new technology called circulating tumor DNA or liquid biopsies. And this there on the left, what that is, is that's a, a tube of blood that's been spun really fast and it separates out the different layers. And the DNA that is circulating in our blood comes from cells that are dying or cells that are turning over. Um, and that DNA can be detected. Now there's normal DNA that's there, but cancer cells make a lot more of it. And it tends to go in one of the particular parts of the blood when it's spun, the plasma. And we can use this to basically sample continuously what's going on in the tumors throughout the body. What's exciting about this is when we biopsy a tumor, if we biopsy a spot in the liver, it, something different might be going on than what's going on in the colon. But because the blood circulates all over the body, we can see what's going on uh, in all those different spots. The pump of the heart basically lets us sample all those different locations all at once. And so we can use this to do two different things. We can look for minimal residual disease. And what that means is we're looking for 
after surgery, are there any signs that the cancer is left? Because in those patients, maybe we want to do something to reduce the risk of the cancer coming back. The other thing that we can do is we can use this to identify all the different mutations that are in a cancer throughout the body and try and figure out how can we target. Maybe their ent that NTREC fusion is there and maybe we don't need to do a painful tissue biopsy if we're able to do this blood test. And uh, it, it really, it takes just two tubes of blood to do one of these tests. And so it's something that, you know, is, is going to be hopefully changing the way that we think about sampling tumors. In Canada, we've got two trials open right now that I'm really excited about. The COBRA or CRC9 trials looking at patients who have no cancer that's spread to their lymph node, the cancer is removed, and then afterwards we often don't give extra chemotherapy. But this study is looking to see if there's ctDNA detected, maybe we should give them more intense chemotherapy because almost all those patients will have their cancer come back. And the group where there's no ctDNA, maybe we don't need to give them anything. We have another trial that's in stage three that's called Dynamic 3. We're doing this with Australia and New Zealand. And it's for patients where the cancer is spread to the lymph node, they have their surgery and hopefully it's all gone. But again, we often give that chemotherapy to reduce the risk. Now on the right, you, what you see is we use the ctDNA to tell us how intense the treatment should be. If we don't detect ctDNA, we're gonna make the treatment less intense to try and save toxicities and make people feel better while they are going through their treatment. And on the right, for patients who have a really high risk of their cancer coming back, because we detected ctDNA, we're going to intensify treatment to try and cure more people. What's also exciting is that we can use the ctDNA when we use things like these new targeted drugs to try and figure out when the cancer is becoming resistant. So as the cancer is being treated, some of the cancer cells start to learn basically how to get around the targeted treatment and they start to grow. And so we can detect this in the ctDNA, which is a really exciting thing that's coming forward in the clinic. Now, it's not just all about mutations. What you see in the top right is the DNA. That's like the recipe book. The mRNA is kind of like you took a photocopy and you take that home from the library. And then protein is what actually is the business and in the cancer cell. And that's what causes things to happen. Now, we've learned that there can be problems at any stage there. And there's also something new called the consensus molecular subtypes. And this looks at the expression of the recipes, basically. How many of the recipes, maybe you make 52 pies out of the recipe book instead of making, and they might all be right, but you made too many of them. So we're trying to use information, not just about mutations, but about these other abnormalities that might help us treat cancer better. So we've talked about a number of different ways that precision medicine is trying to personalize treatment for each of the patients. And I really look forward to the panel discussion to see how this is impacting care for patients across Canada and hopefully making things better. Thank you so much, Dr. Laurie. It's amazing and exciting to see how treatment options have and I guess are constantly advancing and becoming more targeted for the benefit of the patients. So now um, let us hear from Dr. Sheffield on new advances in generation sequencing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Brandon Sheffield and I'm a pathologist. Uh, I just wanted to start by, by telling you a little bit about what that is. I'm, I'm sure many of you guys have met uh, a lot of different doctors, like oncologists and surgeons and gastroenterologists, uh, but uh, very, very few of you probably have ever met a pathologist. And uh, we are physicians, we go to medical school, and uh, we, we do our practice uh, from within the laboratory. This is actually a photo of me sitting right where I'm sitting right now from a different angle. And uh, so we hang out in our office most most of the day uh, looking at tissue samples and uh, we provide a diagnosis for clinicians. So if you've ever uh, been for a colonoscopy and had a polyp removed, uh, we would look at that under the microscope and tell the gastroenterologist uh, how long it should be before your next colonoscopy or if we find something uh, sinister there, if, if you need to, to be referred over to a surgeon. And similarly, if you've ever had a surgical resection, uh, we would look at that and uh, let, let our colleagues in surgery know that uh, they've got everything uh, and the operation was successful. Uh, and we also would tell how advanced a cancer is, and that's information that an oncologist might use to determine whether or not you benefit uh, from additional treatment like chemotherapy. And, uh, you know, I was asked to talk about the future of laboratory medicine, and we're going to do something a little bit dangerous here and do the exact opposite of what we were asked, which is to go uh, to talk about the past. 
And pathology is uh, really, it's a very ancient field. It's been around for many millennia. Uh, and this is one of the earliest depictions of pathology uh, painted by Rembrandt. This is the anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp. And what he's doing here is he's showing the other doctors in the area uh, some anatomy and, and teaching them a little bit about the, the tendons in the arm. And this is really how pathology was practiced for many hundreds of years, just by looking, dissecting, smelling, uh, touching. And, and through this process, we, we really learned quite a bit about disease. And that uh, continued on until a, a really big invention happened, which was the microscope. And when the microscope was invented for the first time ever, we were able to tell uh, what was benign and what was uh, malignant. And that really, you know, when we could see actual cells, it really caused an explosion in the growth and, and knowledge that we had about disease. And pictured here, this is uh, Dr. Pierre Masson, one of the uh, founding fathers of pathology in Canada. And uh, many of the techniques and stains that he first described are still in use today. And you can actually see the microscope that he's using at his desk looks incredibly similar uh, to the microscope that I'm still using right now, almost 100 years later. And uh, here you can see this is a, another picture of me in, in training almost 10 years ago with a very similar microscope and very little has changed. And uh, that's, you know, for the most part, a good thing because it, it's a very useful tool for us to, to direct and manage uh, the flow of, of your care with this disease. So we've learned to recognize that, you know, this is a photo of uh, normal colon uh, tissue. Uh, the food would go in the, the white part at the top and uh, these U-shaped glands would secrete uh, mucin uh, that help with digestion and then also absorb water and nutrients into the bloodstream. And we learned to recognize this as being different from cancer. This is um, in the top right of this uh, picture. You can see some normal uh, colon again. In the top left corner of the picture, uh, hold on, I'm gonna, no, I can't point to it. <laughs> Not that coordinated. But on the top left, you can see uh, a polyp that's a, a serrated adenoma. And then uh, down below on the bottom half, uh, these cells are invading down through the colon and they're forming uh, a cancer. This is another uh, special stain uh, called MMR. And Dr. Lurie was talking about this. Uh, the, you can see all these brown circles are normal cells. These are uh, lymphocytes or blood vessels, and they're turning brown because they pick up this stain for MMR. All the blue circles in this picture are cancer cells, and they're not picking up this stain. So we can say that this cancer is MMR deficient. And when we supply this kind of information, it helps an oncologist choose the best possible treatment. We know that the patients uh, will respond very well to drugs called uh, immunotherapy or immune checkpoint inhibitors. It's one o'clock. Sorry, that's my computer. Uh, and in addition, this information also helps uh, make sure that we can mitigate the risk of colon cancer uh, in your family members as well. Now, this is about as close as we can get to cancer cells uh, with our microscope. This is cranked up to the absolute maximum capacity, and this is the closest we can get is seeing the outside of the cells as little blue circles. But what we really want to do is be able to get to look inside of the cell. And for that, we really need to use our imagination. And it, in our heads, this is what it would look like. This is a picture of the MAP uh, kinase pathway uh, that Dr. Lurie was talking about. And uh, there's a couple of key members to this pathway, uh, starting with the uh, little uh, yellow molecule that says ligand beside it in this picture. It's right around two o'clock uh, on, on the edge of the cell. This is a molecule called the epidermal growth factor or EGF. And when it lands on its receptor known as EGF receptor or EGFR, the other name for that is HER1, the molecule becomes very excited. It starts to uh, look for a, a partner, almost like a dance partner. And its favorite dance partner is a molecule called HER2 or it might look for another HER1, like EGFR, or a HER3 or a HER4. And when it finds that partner, they start to kick their feet. 
except their feet are underneath the cell. You can see them sticking out just under the membrane there. And when they start kicking their feet, they like to activate uh, their friend RAS. The most common RAS is called KRAS or Kirsten RAS. Uh, there's other RASs like HRAS or Harvey RAS and NRAS. And when uh, the RASs get excited, they in turn kick their friends, the RAF molecules. And the most common one is BRAF, but we also have ARAF and CRAF. And those get excited and they in turn uh, activate their friend MEC, who in turn activates their friend ERK. And ERK goes into the cell nucleus. That's the epicenter, the command center of the cell where all the DNA is. And ERK turns on genes that make the cells grow, divide. They make them start moving around in space and they give them the ability to invade. That means they can move even though there's something in front of them, they can cut through it. And those are all the properties of cancer. So this pathway is activated in the majority of colon cancers. It's an important pathway to have around. We need it when we're embryos growing into people or when we're uh, babies growing up into adults. This is what helps us develop. And if you've ever uh, cut your finger in the kitchen or the garage, uh, it, it's very important for healing. When, when the knife cuts through uh, the tissue in your skin, uh, that releases EGF molecules that float to either side of the skin until they hit intact cells. They activate the EGFR receptor and cause the skin cells on either side to start growing, dividing, moving, and invading through that scab uh, until they, they reform a skin layer. So it's a very, very important pathway to have. But unfortunately, in cancer, this becomes activated constitutively or all the time and it doesn't ever turn off. So what we really need to do is identify which of these colored blobs is activated so that we can pass that information on to an oncologist who can prescribe a specific targeted therapy to turn off the protein that's causing the problem. Now, just like when the microscope was invented, we had an explosion of new knowledge. Right now, we are in another revolution in science and medicine with instruments like this. This is a next generation gene sequencer. And this allows us to see inside of a cell past where our microscopes have ever let us see before to tell us which exact aberrations have gone wrong inside of your cancer and tra uh, translate that into a targeted therapy or a precision treatment. And as was mentioned, it, you know, the, when the human genome first came out, it, this was exceedingly expensive and unattainable. It took about 10 years to sequence the first human genome and it cost a billion dollars. Right now we can do that in a single day and it costs under a thousand dollars, making this accessible uh, to guide every patient's treatment. But one other limiting factor is the drugs that are available. When, when this first came out in 1998, we only had one targeted inhibitor, it was to HER2. And then uh, our, our colleagues in the pharmaceutical industry developed BRAF inhibitors. Uh, so we had that available. And now the number of drugs is really expanding so we can almost inhibit any step of that pathway that we find to be activated. And here again, the number of drugs is just continuing to grow. And this type of medicine is becoming so uh, dominant that the, the type of drugs that are available are not just for colon cancer or breast cancer or lung cancer, but they're gonna be available for any cancer that has say a deficiency in MMR or a rearrangement of NTRAC. And it's a much more powerful and personalized way of practicing medicine in cancer care. And then, the most exciting thing of all, you might not even need to do this on a biopsy for much longer because we do have the ability to get all this information right out of a peripheral blood sample, uh, which would really facilitate things uh, for patients and uh, speed up this process considerably. So. I think it's a very exciting time in medicine. We're on the, uh, the verge of really changing the way uh, things are practiced. And much like when the microscope came out, how we had this explosion of new knowledge and new treatments, we're right now inside of a major revolution that's changing the way uh, we treat this disease. 
one thing I would thank you guys for very much is for your advocacy and your voice here. Even though these treatments are, are great and they're saving lives and they're prolonging lives, they do represent a change and they, uh, it can be difficult to usher in that change. So we do need your continued advocacy as a patient voice, as well as uh, together with Colorectal Cancer Canada, to continue to advocate for the best possible lab testing uh, to guide your therapy. So thank you very much and I look forward to the discussion and any questions you guys might have. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield, for demystifying, I guess, the role of pathologists. I have to say, I wish I would have had professors using something like dance analogy when I was studying in genetics. It would have made it clearer for me. We will now open the floor for questions from the audience. Welcome everyone. So um, thank you for these great presentations. It's just fascinating to see what's what's coming and, and uh, sooner than we think. So we have a, a first question from the audience in terms of uh, related to, um, to mutations. So um, I think maybe Dr. Laurie, this is for you in terms of are the mutation discovered on the biopsy of the tumor or can they be also detected easily in the blood right now? Can you, I know you spoke a little bit about that, but can you explore a little bit more? Yeah, so we do see that a lot of the same mutations are present in the blood that are present in the tissue, particularly the ones that we use to make treatment selections for some of the first uh, treatment options, so things like ARATs and NRAS and BRAF. What's exciting about the blood is that we can see some of the mutations that tumors get during their treatment. Um, mm. as as a cancer is exposed to chemotherapy, it might develop new mutations that might make it susceptible to something. Um, and so that provides an opportunity to learn more about the cancer over time. Now, if there isn't very much cancer in the body, sometimes we can't detect those mutations in the liquid biopsy, um, but that depends on each case, how much circulating tumor DNA is, is a kind of floating around in the blood. And that's something that the newer tests, as we're moving along, they're getting better and better at finding these mutations. Thank you, thank you. Um, another question is about, um, again, the uh, the mutually exclusivity of some of those uh, mutation. So mutation like key rays and N rays and MSI are are they mutually exclusive, um, and are they tested like in terms of in maybe like for Dr. Laurie and Dr. Sheffield after that are they all tested standard as a standard in in the pathology um, test that you do. That's a, a super good question. And uh, the answer is different for each of those mutations. So uh, MMR or MSI is not mutually exclusive with other mutations. And we frequently see that at the same time as mutations like BRAF or, or NTRAC fusions. Uh, but other mutations like KRAS typically are mutually exclusive with other mutations like BRAF or NRAS. So we like to uh, evaluate the tumor as a whole, and we like to include as many of those uh, tests into a single assay, if possible. And that's why we prefer to use tests like next generation sequencing that will in, uh, involve uh, 20 or 50 or 100 of these genes all at the same time, as opposed to single gene testing. Mm. And are they all kind of, do you, when you do the pathology of a, of a tissue, do, are, are they all part of standard protocol? Are you all looking for those mutations? That's, it's um, different in each hospital, unfortunately. So it would depend on uh, where you got your biopsy and where that biopsy was analyzed. Uh, but it's an important question to perhaps go over with your oncologist. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Um, there's another question about the status of approval for checkpoint inhibitors for MSI patients or beacon for BRAF. Um, any information in terms of that kind of approval status? You know, bo both of those are, are really exciting um, new treatments that we're going to have hopefully available in Canada shortly. Uh, they're going through the approval process, which is a bit of a complicated process in that 
what happens is there's first an application to Health Canada, which is the FDA in the United States, and that says that a drug is allowed to be used. Um, and then afterwards, there's a process where all of the provinces come together and look at how effective a drug is and how much it costs, and they meet and decide about funding, and then there's a negotiation process with the company that makes the drugs. And so both of those drugs are going through that, that process that has multiple steps. Um, it's not something that's mm. currently available. We're very fortunate that there have been some access programs for those drugs where while this approval process is ongoing, the companies have been providing some compassionate supply in the interval um, for cases that meet the criteria. And so that's that's been really nice, um, a good, a helpful thing for the companies to have provided. And we're, we're really grateful for that. Okay. So, so something that you take into account with patients and being able to offer compassionate uh, support if needed. Okay. Um, and then if I look at um, other question, um, they're moving. It's interesting because I don't you know they can vote on questions. So they're be being prioritized. One in terms of maybe for you, Dr. Shetty, after having an APR in 2015, is there any possibility of a new surgical technique to restore that part of the col colon system? Yeah, that's, that question is actually much more common than you would think um, with mm -hmm. patients looking for some form of uh, possibility of being able to go back to the bathroom naturally. Unfortunately, there's nothing in the, um, there there some there have been some people who talked about it, but there's nothing in the works right now. Um, but, you know, with, with advances in tissue engineering, you never know what would happen in the future. Okay. So maybe something to come with everything that you talked about. Um, a question um, about um, can patient request to have their tumor profiled upon diagnosis? So even before seeing their oncologist, for example, at the time of surgery, um, if not, what is the best way to get biomarked? So that question would depend a little bit on um on where a sample is being uh, tested because there's a different process that happens in each place. Some places it might be tested automatically and other places it might need to be ordered. Uh, it would be something a patient could discuss with their um, surgeon or you know, with some another member of the team who might be able to order it, but it, it would really depend on where their, their care is being delivered and how those tests are ordered because it's different in each place. Um, and there are some tests that might be paid for by a, the provincial system in each place, and there might be some tests that might not be. Um, and so it's it's helpful to have that consultation with the oncologist to help guide around what might be funded. Um, but there's other members of the team that can help um, that you might see before the medical oncologist. Yeah, so it's about that partnership with your with your physician. Um, I'm hearing that in all of your answers. Um, I have a question from Laura that's saying, I'm wondering if, is surgical terminology like minimally invasive surgery standard uh, standard across the board? Any opinion on that, Dr. Shetty? I think minimally invasive surgery is a bit of an umbrella term to be able to refer mm -hmm. to things like laparoscopic surgery, single, single port surgery, uh, robotic surgery, um, even, you know, um, natural orifice surgery where you know sometimes uh, some surgeons will, will go to purely through the through the anus or even transvaginally to perform abdominal procedures um, the latter two are more experimental at times um, but minimally invasive tends to be a bit more of an umbrella umbrella term but there is a little bit of a um, as I mentioned in the talk, there is some confusion sometimes um, in terms of what that is specifically refers to and whether it's the extent of surgery versus the incisions based on, you know, being performed for surgery. And it's, uh, you know, some patients have been concerned that they want, they want you know, the maximal extent of, uh, of cancer resection to be performed and that minimally invasive yeah. might have a negative connotation in that realm. So we spend quite a bit of time educating patients on, um, uh, on that concept, using these terms like keyhole surgery, uh, just small incisions, and uh, um, it, it does help quite a bit. Thank you, Dr. Shelley. I have to say in all the, your presentation, I just love the way that you're very 
uh, clear and the way you explain it. You make it so um, easy to understand and pragmatic. Um, uh, another question is about testing protocol. Um, do these testing protocol depend or test protocol depends on the stage of the diagnostic? Sometimes. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's hard to describe what happens to every patient in Canada because each province is different. And then within mm -hmm. each province, each hospital comes up with their own um, flow chart or algorithm. So uh, really, at the, at the moment, this process is going to look different for, for every patient uh, in the country. And that's something that we're working towards changing, is creating a national standard. And that's something that uh, we're really relying on, on Colorectal Cancer Canada and, and the patients in this country to help, uh, help us spearhead, to make sure that everybody coast to coast gets the exact same uh, treatment from a molecular point of view. Okay. I think it, that raises a, a really good point about the right test for the right patient being important as well, because sometimes we don't need some of the information. There might be some things that we mm -hmm. think are useful for all patients, but there might be some tests that don't provide extra information. And we need to be cautious because whether it's the healthcare system or it's the patient that's paying for it, those might be extra costs that might not be needed. And so that's why it's it's really important, as Dr. Sheffield mentioned, to think about each case individually and how 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 we can best deliver the best care. Yeah, what I mean, what our goal really, uh, we would like to have our, our tests available so that they're they're here and that our clinicians, like our surgeons and our oncologists, can order them when they need them for the patient, rather rather than supplying them all up front when they might provide unnecessary information and might not be yeah. utilized at that time. Yeah, so having the right information and, 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 uh, and for the right patient. Um, there's a question about, and there could be a spelling, so I may need your, 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 your help here, but there's someone asking about um, if you could talk about the panat panatumabab. Is that the right spelling? Yeah? I think that is, and I think Dr. Yeah. Larry would be the best person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Was there a specific question about panatumumab? Can you talk a bit about it? So I think it's just, again, a bit more information about it. Okay. So uh, panatumumab is in a class of drugs. They're called anti-EGFR antibodies. And so what those are is our body makes antibodies to fight bacterial infections or to fight anything foreign that comes in. And scientists have done a, a really good job of figuring out how to make those antibodies that can tackle things that are on cancer cells. And so there's a receptor, uh, Dr. Sheffield talked about the receptor needing to kick its feet and dance. Well, in colon cancer, there's one receptor that is usually at the dance party and uh, it's called EGFR. There's usually too many of them at the dance party. And so um, this antibody is something that we can give through a, a, an intravenous um, it goes in through the blood and it basically grabs onto the cancer cells where there's more of these receptors and it helps to kill the cancer cell both from by grabbing it and alerting the immune system that it's there. Um, there's another drug called cetuximab that does something very similar. Um, and these are drugs that are used at various points during the treatment of, of colon cancer. One important thing is that if there's a mutation in, in certain genes that are part of the pathway that EGFR uses, it that drug might not work and it might only give side effects. And so that's part of the reason that working with Dr. Sheffield is, is really helpful to, to have that information so we can pick the right drug. And if panatumumab is not going to work, we can pick something else that might work. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for this, this answer. So I think with the time, like um, a little bit up for question, I really wanna thank you so much, uh, three of you for sharing and clarifying such important information. I really like all the analogy that you use to make things pragmatic, genetics and technology advances, providing the opportunity for personalized treatment, precision and patient outcomes. So um, a lot of interest and a lot of thank you in the audience. Looking for, to the future and the continued evolution of treatment, um, certainly is not simple if we look at everything that's coming, but uh, obviously providing so much hope and possible solutions. So thank you to the three of you um, for a great session.